Hi, I'm Matthias. And I'm May. And this is a smattering of World War One era semi-automatic handguns of a yes. martial nature. Mm-hmm. Very large. Mm -hmm. And today is a special, and you've probably already read the title, but we're going to be counting down our favorite semi-automatic handguns. Yes, from the bottom up. Yeah. Not counting down from the bottom up. No, it's up. a countdown because you're oh, going okay, one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, number to one. To the final count. Thank you. Don't get a struck already. We, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's copyright. You can't ever talk. Uh, <laughs> these are noticeably uh, one of a kind. Uh, they all are different, but they all of are a type. Mm -hmm. uh, you will note no wheel guns on the table. No, not a single one. Uh, we... Uh, we figured it, they can't really compete with the semi-auto pistols, so if anything, they'll be their own category potentially someday. Yeah, I mean, the very best revolver might make it to the bottom of the pistol list, but it's not likely. Yeah. And then within these as well... No pocket pistols. These are all Marshall revol or Marshall semi-automatics. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Ruby's not in here, even though the Ruby's are the most Marshall of the non-military yeah, 32s. I that, yeah. Same with like a Star nineteen fourteen. They were they were meant that they were meant to buff up a thirty two blowback to be military ish. Right. FN nineteen hundreds got pressed into military service fairly early, even though mm -hmm. they were more of a commercial concern to begin with. But we're just not counting the thirty two blowbacks, right? Because we consider them to be more pocket pistols. They're certainly not what most countries are trying to select for an automatic handgun, mm -hmm. and the best among them are still going to rank fairly low. Right, with in lock comparison. breech or larger caliber pistols. That's possible something like maybe, you know, some of them like the Savage 1907. Yeah. yeah 10 rounds, pretty good. They're, Could have competed with some, maybe some of the worst of these guys, but right. you know. That's a problem for us to solve another day, though. Right. Let's limit it to Marshall semi automatic handguns. Yeah, get on top of it. <laughs> And in that regard, May has made a list out of all the things you she has shot. You them the list. I'm going to have to blur it well, out now. We don't now. film at that good of a resolution. Oh, sweet. Uh, Although maybe if we have more support, then we'll get better cameras, and then I will have to blur it out. That's exciting. I'm going to ask you to start this list. I know it's top 10. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to start at 11. At 11? Yes, and there's a reason for that, which okay. is, uh, you know, I'll reveal it later. But okay. let's just go ahead and start with 11. Can I give you your own list? Yep. Now, can you read your own handwriting? Bergman. Mm -hmm. What is this in reference to? Our dog. No. no. <laughs> it's to the Bergman pistol, actually. That's right. Specifically, this is a Danish contract model of 1910. Yes. The Germans seized a number of these uh, that were available in Belgium when they, well, seized the country, really. Right. So uh, these got pressed into German service. A pre-existing model um, from Spain with slightly different disconnect system mm -hmm. and slightly different contours in various places was in service with, you'll guess this, Spain. Oh, God. Introduced the 9mm Largo cartridge. Mm -hmm. This is a locked breech, semi-automatic with a detachable box magazine, double stacked, with six rounds, mm -hmm. which is an unusual decision. And uh, actually very few of these, it's, uh, or unlike very... Uh, unlike most of these, that's uh, one of only two, I think, where the mag is ahead of the trigger guard. Yes, uh, magazine uh, forward of the trigger guard. Mm -hmm. It's also the only one that I think I know of that has a six-round capacity. Yes. Because almost every semi-automatic attempted to beat the revolver by at least one round. Mm -hmm. This one's just like, no, nah, what if we just did <laughs> six? You <laughs> did six. Hey, it's the, the same the, as a revolver. All the room in the world, by the way, to just as much oh, as yeah, you Oh, yeah, extend it. Do whatever. Because, I mean, look, it, it, you could even extend it down to the bottom of the grip, essentially, and you would get, what, at least double the capacity? I've seen guys mod uh, Bergman submachine gun magazines yeah. to fit in here so they can just have, like... Awesome. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Just got to find that much Largo. Yeah. Uh, anyway... Let me give you this for a moment. All right. So this ranked number 11. It didn't even make the top 10. No, it did not. Which I imagine, despite the fact that it's semi-automatic, um, there must be some sort of other problem going on this. So could you tell us just, you don't have to be, you know, we don't need all the detail. Uh-huh. But what are some of the problems with this gun? What, what's not working for you that made it to be all the way at number 11? Well, um, the ergonomics on this one are actually just super awkward entirely. Um, with the mag, that forward of the grip, everything's really kind of front heavy on this one. So mm -hmm. it's kind of an awkward one in general for feel. Um, the grip itself, not the most comfy, I would it's say. It's like a weird pseudo like broom belt. handle It's grip. like base. Oh, kind of. Yeah, it is like a pseudo belt, uh, broom handle grip, essentially. It's not actually weirdly as uncomfortable as the broom handle, but 
it's still not great. It's, yeah. it's not pretty perfect there. Um, mag release on this guy is actually quite difficult. And we've noticed that across the board on several of these that it's never been super easy. Yeah, even handling the Spanish model like we managed to do after we had filmed our episode on this gun. Mm -hmm. That magazine release is not something you want to attempt to do with your index finger, which would be the most natural position to do it in. Mm -hmm. You have to put your other thumb in there and crank down and also somehow pinch and yank that magazine out. Right. It's a very awkward claw hand position. Now, if we don't want to consider that, because I think we are talking this like you um, have talked about in the perspective of it's supposed to be for a, a pistol that I am handling with a single hand. Like mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not using two hands. I only get one. True. And then I am drawing, firing, and that's it. Like I don't, are we talk, do we want to include reloads in this? There's essentially? essentially two ways we can think about this problem. Right, thank you, by the way. We haven't even gotten to the top 10, so this is still fair game. Mm -hmm. uh, in defining this, I want to make sure that May consider this in basically two regards. Mm -hmm. All Overarching is the fact that all these are should be one-handed pistols, because right. that is how pistols were taught and shot in the Great War period. Mm -hmm. I know it's better to shoot pistols two-handed, and you could be a savant that comes up with this idea, but generally, if you had two hands available, you should have been grabbing a rifle or carbine. Right. So they thought, nope, you just and go. This was the, uh, these were supposed to be intended for just, oh, the enemy is upon you or you need to escape and your rifle is not in your hand for some reason. Sort of. That's, you're out. that's scenario one. Okay. Yeah. Um, officers might not be given a rifle or carbine. That's pop. You yep. may have an auxiliary role where you're not given a rifle or carbine or on rare occasion, you could end up with both a rifle and this, although that's very unusual. Mm -hmm. Um, What's going to happen, though, is you're going to face one of two scenarios. The first scenario is kind of what May was saying. You are commanding troops, driving a truck, working artillery, and then bleh, the enemy's on top of you, and you have to grab and point and flick or whatever you need to do to make it ready, mm -hmm. and pow, 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 and you basically only have the capacity of your magazine to work with because even the fastest of reloads is going to take precious seconds that you don't necessarily have. You are under attack. Right. The, that would be the purely defensive nature of the handgun. Mm -hmm. The other way to think about this is during the course of the Great War, people became more and more interested in trench warfare, trench clearing. The submachine gun was not developed until the very end of the war. I mean, technically there were pistol caliber automatics, but we're talking about Villa Perosas that are like little mounted things. <laughs> Shoulder fired, ready to go submachine guns were a very late introduction. Right. So the pistol filled in that gap for quite a while. Mm-hmm. That is also a way to think of this, is that you are going in to a hostile trench and maybe you had a bolt action on your way in or somebody else covered you, but now that you're in there, you gotta get through this environment and you have to keep your pistol close and knock down guys as you fight. Right. In that scenario, having a rapid reload is fairly critical. Mm -hmm. All right, with that covered, mm -hmm. uh, unbalanced magazine is slow to reload and change out. Yep. Lower magazine capacity being only six rounds. Mm -hmm. Uh, anything else that stands out as bizarre? Safety isn't amazing, but it's mm -hmm. okay. Like it's just it's it's a, it's very elongated safety for uh, actuating on and or off. Which mm -hmm. in this scenario, for the most likely, I am going to be wanting to flip it off very quickly. Right. And luckily, there is like a position that it does want to latch into place. However, I will say you do have to go past like a biased point. Like it isn't naturally wanting to fall into place. And you're also breaking your grip slightly to do it. Right. So that is a little bit unsettling as somebody who is in either of those scenarios, okay. I would think. Well, let me take a look at your list. You have now said that number 10, just ahead of the Bergman, is the C96. That's probably going to make some people mad in some ways. It, it is very confusing to me. Um, you're looking at, in the case of the Bergman, you have 9mm Largo. Yep. In the CNA-6, you either have 7.63 Mauser or 9mm Parabellum. True. And you can't tell me, if you pick that up, mm -hmm. that that is going to be somehow less awkward handling than the Bergman. You have no detachable box magazine, at least in the standard configuration. Correct. Um, the safety is not any faster. This one no, being an Italian one's... example has a short sweep safety, which is actually more pleasant. Mm -hmm. But the later versions that you see more commonly in the war have a big long sweep just like that. Right. Also equally awkward. Um, <laughs> I do love the rear side that they were that optimistic about me doing long range with this guy. <laughs> well, it is because it also served as a carby. Right. So that's why some people might actually get a little bit frustrated with this being my number 10. Okay. However going into the negative aspects of it. Um, yeah, the broom handle, absolutely awkward. I can't say that the handling of this is technically better than the Bergman. If anything, it's a little bit worse. Mm -hmm. However, okay. 10 rounds. 
10 rounds okay. is pretty good. So it's an awkward draw. It's yep. fairly long, so it's going to take a while to clear leather. Oh, yeah, absolutely. When you point, it's pointing okay. Yeah, it's pointing okay. It's got a long sight radius there. Yeah, your bore axis is in another zip code, though, so mm -hmm. flip is pretty bad. Yep. However, yep. you're feeling more confident because it's a powerful cartridge, mm -hmm. and you get 10 of them. And I get 10 of them. And yes, there is the option for the potential of having the stock. However, I can't necessarily guarantee that. No, but if we are considering this as, so in defensive, mm -hmm. yeah, probably not gonna have a stock. Right. Offensive though, you probably would know to put that stock on. Mm -hmm. So if you were using it for trench clearing, yep. you could get away with fitting that stock. Right, but that's that's kind of one of those moments where I have to try to treat this more of as just a well, as, as a pistol. Is this well-rounded? Definitely not. Hmm. Need some improvement. And also stripper clip loading. But still good enough to beat the Bergman. Yes. Just because of magazine capacity, you think? Definitely increases its chances, yeah. Would you say that's because they're both very slow loading? Is that really why you went with, well, I get four more rounds before I have to right. go through whatever Essentially, that... it's I get at least four more chances to knock people down as opposed to the six. That is a very meager amount by comparison. Okay, I could see that. Now, it is possible to put a stock on a Bergman, but that feature was not common to the 1910s that were pressed into the war, just right. so everybody's aware. Uh, let's see, number nine, we don't actually have on the table. Uh, that was a loner that we no longer have here. That's so true. Most of these are still loners, they're just still here. Mm -hmm. Um, the Luger LP08. Yes. Which would be the same thing. It's a stocked Luger with a long barrel. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have plenty of footage of you shooting one, I'm sure. Yes. This is, how did this beat out the C96? Well, in general, the handling on it is is a Luger essentially. So we've talked about that. It's got that toggle lock action mm -hmm. that is pretty easy to actuate, I would say. Um, the grip itself is very ergonomically comfortable as a shooter. The mm -hmm. triggers are usually pretty easy. That crescent trigger, very good pull. Mm -hmm. Mag release on them is pretty quick, but you know. I, I mean, I extremely fast, didn't oh, think about it. Absolutely. Um, and so, it, and it tends to point pretty well, yeah. like in terms of lining up for the sight with the rear and the front, pretty easy. So an LP08 without the stock mm -hmm. is really just a very modern handgun in its handling. Right. Uh, it should be near the top of this list. What's keeping it down? Well, it's got that exceptionally long barrel. <laughs> and I imagine the rear sight that's a mile away doesn't help either. It doesn't, no. Unfortunately, that does make it, lining up your sights kind of take you some time. Now, granted, if it was in the carbine configuration, that definitely would be fantastic with it. But mm -hmm. the problem is, is that if I treat it as a, just a pistol on its own, lining up quickly, it might be something that I'm not I, that I, I I'm just not as fast with that I would like to be. Right, so it this, makes me nervous. This puts you into the position of being able to use it very well offensively, like the C96, even better so. Right, but defensively, not great not defensively. So much. As a matter of fact, I think the barrel is even longer. So trying to yes. get that out by dragging it straight into your own armpit and mm -hmm. then presenting it, it short range is going to be a bit of a struggle to get it out and ready. But once you start swinging, I think it I think it would hit. Right, so I think, respectively, it deserves to be in the top 10, but it's just not the, the top of the top 10. Sure, sure. Okay, so next we do have this one here is number, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, number eight, you gave to the FN 1903. Thank you. Now, this is a Browning designed blowback, nine millimeter, not quite parabellum. Right. Uh, it uses its own proprietary cartridge. Mm-hmm. Fairly severe on the recoil because it is an unlocked breech, but yep. also reasonably powerful enough. Mm -hmm. This is slide operated. Yep. Uh, heel release magazine. Mm -hmm. So, oh, and a safety in an easy thumb off position. Yep. Safety is in a, a decent spot. That makes this a fairly modern pistol. Actually, incredibly modern okay. if you think about it in that way. What are the problems? Well, you, you just kind of said it in that it's a blowback pistol, and with that cartridge, it's got not the best recoil. It's incredibly flippy and you feel it all up in the webbing of your hand. And then we also have a heel release magazine, which aren't really my favorite in terms of just unloading and reloading. They oh. tend to be a bit sticky, unfortunately. That's fair. Um, but yeah, otherwise everything else is actually pretty fantastic about it. It's narrow. It's actually got a grip safety on here along with a, like a standard flip safety up above the grip. Sights are okay. I mean, and it's very, very slim, which makes it have the potential even for concealment if I wanted. So there's a lot of good pro things with it. And the trigger is actually pretty decent too. A lot of it is, is pretty solid. It's just 
Unfortunately, that recoil is just quite terrible. If this had a locked breech, I feel like it would be near the top. Not wrong. Why? A locked breech on that would make a huge difference. And there is a 9mm locked breech pistol slide operated from that exact same mm. era from Browning. Huh. But uh, huh. not the one that was made by FN. No. Uh, this was meant to be very simple in construction. Right. I will say I agree with you. It's nice that it has the grip safety in the sense that you could, in a hurry, pop, pop, put it away. I like that. That makes Don't it very modern Don't have to worry about me. it. Mm -hmm. Pull it out, pop, pop, and it's just by gripping it, you've enabled the pistol to be able to be fired. Right. Position, uh, manual safety is also there, so if that's what you're accustomed to, you just drop your thumb, yeah. it's ready to go. You've essentially got both options available to you, and I, that modern safety actually, really, this grip modern safety, to me, that's why it kind of ends up, not really, it's still not in the top five, but it still ends up above things like the C96 or the Luger lp 8 I'm going to tell you, I'm reading ahead on this list, and there's a very comparable blowback pistol that is ranked above this one. Mm -hmm. Is there another issue that you perhaps have with this gun? It. The thing is, I don't think of this because it doesn't really affect me, but I noticed the grip is a little bit short. Yes. Um, it just barely, so holding it for this camera, you can see my pinky ends up on there, but I know just... A dude with it, that even that is my height is going to have slightly larger hands, and for them that means that they're they're coming off the grip. I mean, for you, I right. imagine, yeah, I'm, not that you are the average size by any means. For no, but I'm kind of. This is very interesting. You are the average height, so you work well for the rifle. Right demonstration. Uh, demonstrations. Mm -hmm. For the handguns, it's a little weirder because my hand is probably I'm a little long fingered for that era, mm -hmm. but the thickness of my hand, the size of my hand, would have been fairly common for men of that period. And my hand, and, unfortunately is not appropriate male man sized for my height. Not only am I coming off the pistol, but the back, despite being mostly straight, rounds off at the edge. Mm -hmm. And it gives a little softness right into that palm. I could see that. Which means that there's not as much control as you'd like. Uh, this is the kind of gun that if it just had even a half inch more grip, it would have increased the magazine capacity. Mm -hmm. And it would have made this a lot easier to control. We've talked about this before. Don't get me wrong, that rounded edge, it can feel nice in some ways, but yeah, if it just, if it settles just wrong against your palm swell, it really can cause an accidental, like, mushiness to your own grip with it. Right, I agree. All right, so next up on the list is going to be an unusual choice to some. Mm -hmm. Number seven, May has decided on the Nambu 1902 Type A Modified. <laughs> I get it. It's a little bit strange, I imagine. Yeah, that is... The Nambu being ranked anywhere in a top 10 pistols competition seems strange. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to point out some guns that are all the way off this list. <laughs> all the way off? <laughs> yeah, would include something like the Roth uh, Krinka or mm -hmm. Rothschild in 8mm. Right. This is an 8mm lock breech pistol. Mm -hmm. That was an 8mm lock pistol. That one used a rotating barrel right. and fed from stripper clips. Mm -hmm. This one uses a sort of tilting locking block at the back mm -hmm. and loads from magazines. Well, the tilting locking block is actually a really solid design. Yeah, um, this is actually a pistol that has a fairly... Honestly, the biggest problem I know of with the number, and I hate to sort of say this for you, okay. is it has a very weak cartridge Yeah, that's weaker than it needs to be because the pistol actually has the it locking strength. It should have strength. the capacity, yeah. Yeah, it should be able to do more just by the way it's designed. Mm -hmm. However, uh, can you tell me what you like about the Nambu that maybe people don't know to appreciate? Well, there's little things like the grip safety. Again, I, I mentioned that's kind of just a nice standard thing. Now, the, granted, there are no other safeties on this one, so that is all you have, right. which is fine. I mean, that, that that works for what it is. That means that you can have it chamber ready in your holster, pull out, grip, and go. Right. Perfectly reasonable. Can't argue with that. And then it has a solid mag release uh, button right here that is Luger-esque right. right there behind the trigger. It's clearly coming from the Luger School of Magazine Design. It's right there where the thumb is. You can activate it one-handed, drop the mag, catch it, put in a new mag. It's it's absolutely modern in that regard. Right. And then I guess I won't still understand this one. So this one isn't a stocked pistol or option for it, yet it has this... Tangent really. Tangent. Right? That's not something I love about it. I'm, it. It's just weird to me that it still has a tangent... It, it's a very strange carryover because it's precursor, uh, what people often call the Grandpa Nambu, mm -hmm. uh, had the ability to take a stock. The 1902 Type A modified, as we're calling it, mm -hmm. is the one that was adopted by the Japanese Navy. So uh, you could private purchase Nambus that had other features. Um, I'm sure you could get stock features on whatever if you asked. But 
as far as the Navy was concerned, it was just this pistol. Mm-hmm. And yet, you're right, it does have a bizarre tangent leaf sight that's actually fairly fine to read. Yeah, it is actually incredibly fine. The only other thing that's really super positive about it is I love this grip on the knob. Right, that like very this, aggressive right yeah, grip. Yeah, this deep, like, uh, a, a swoop right here, essentially, where you grab it in between the webbing where your forefinger mm-hmm. and your and your thumb, and then the actual rake on it. That is that angle steeper than the Luger, I want to say? Um, I'm not sure, but it's very positive. It is very positive, but it feels so good when you grip into it. Like, it almost feels like... I can't really... I'm trying to think of a way to describe this. It kind of feels like both parts of my hand are equally pulling into each other. Ergonomically, it's a very comfortable grip for me. Excellent. Now, the Nambu also has an unusual thing. We don't use lanyards on our show, Mm -hmm. but it's also kind of fun to note that it has a high lanyard ring above the palm. Yeah, I do see that. Uh, That is very unusual for military pistols and revolvers. You see it in the Luger. You see it in the Nambu. uh, You actually see it in some early Danish revolvers. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's really about it off the top of my head. I'm sure somebody can think of some other examples, but it is uncommon. So that's kind of interesting as well. That means that your lanyard's not likely to get in your way as you go to grab for the pistol because yeah, if you're it doesn't get away of the high, it doesn't get away of the bolt coming back either. It doesn't get in the way really of your grip. It kind of just it's in a it's in probably what is the most optimal spot for it to be to be the least amount in the way. Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I I can see it. So the problems. What have we got going wrong here? Well, it, it's like you said, just the caliber pretty much is incredibly weak. Yeah. And despite its Luger pedigree, it has a fairly high bore axis. So even if you pump up that cartridge. Right. It's going to have that flipping capability to it. You're not yeah. wrong. So that put the Nambu at, let's just review, number seven. Yes. What beat this out is at number six, you have on here the Beretta 1915. I do been a while, hasn't it? That's actually, <laughs> goodness gracious, that's been since, oh God, 2017. Now this is the first of Beretta's military handguns. It mm-hmm. is a blowback 9mm Glacenti cartridge, yep. which was the exact same dimensions as 9mm Parabellum, but dialed back by a couple hundred FPS mm-hmm. because, uh, uh, frankly, oh uh, God, I don't, cronyism? <laughs> cronyism? <laughs> so a what pistol that? that did not make the top 10 at all was the Glacenti, which we happen oh, to have here. yeah, no. The Italian Glacenti has... I didn't even put it in the top 15. I just put it <laughs> off to the side with that in the brick seal with the word no. The Glacenti has always given us a little bit of trouble. It's very complicated in its construction, mm-hmm. and it essentially uses the Ravelli locking system that would also be used on a machine gun. Mm-hmm. It's called the Glacenti because Ravelli hid his name from the trials because he was on the board that was deciding on the adoption of this pistol, that's not a good sign. Right. So this is a gun that suffers from, in our in, in our utilization of it, not infrequent malfunctions. This and the naval Brixia version, which is a simplified version. Uh, it's fairly complicated. The cartridge is a lower-powered 9mm parabellum because it can't handle 9mm parabellum. And it just has, like, weird pseudo-heel release, very high bore axis. And despite being a fairly comfortable grip with an automatic safety, it just doesn't seem to make the cut for trust. Yeah, no, it really didn't. Uh, May and I went back and forth on this one a little bit. If we could believe in it, and if it had the correct power, it, honestly, we're kind of unfair to it. It should rank somewhere around the Nambu. We just couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't bring ourselves our, to acknowledge it. Right. I don't know how to explain it. We couldn't put our bothers. faith in it. Yeah, so it got ranked down. Now, this is a subjective list. I know people are going to hoot and holler. Oh, well, yeah. Everyone's if gonna. you would like to put this next to the Nambu, that's fine. I, I would agree with you in some ways. However, we can't bring ourselves to it. Right, no. All right, so <clears throat> then using that cartridge, mm-hmm. this guy is a blowback pistol. Right. Which has its own recoil spring and a little buffer spring in there to help deal with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, single stack detachable box magazine heel release. Yep. And slide, two safeties. slide operated and very bizarrely two safeties. Yep. One a trigger block and one a hammer lock. Mm-hmm. Um, what are the pros? How are we feeling well about this? Well, it, it is actually very well balanced, I noticed, while handling it. Um, actually, on range that day, we, we must have taken, I think, eight other pistols that day itself because back then we were insane mm-hmm. and we did a bunch of them at once. But this one 
performed just well. We yep. didn't have to do any extra takes with it. It just ran, which was really kind of a nice refresher for over, that day. Over the years, we've handled a few of these and never had one not run, right. no matter how poor they may be in construction. Or just in or terms wear. of appearance, yeah. yeah. They just tend to run. <laughs> and then overall, it grip-wise, it's a solid full grip, so I, I can't see anyone falling off this mm -hmm. guy. I don't know, it feels great in a lot of ways. Now, um, I will say there are, like I said, some negatives to it um, that do put it not in the top five, though. Right. Um, <clears throat> so being a blowback, you right. know, obviously we're going to have some snappy. pretty snappy recoil. Yeah, and it doesn't really get great. Safeties, the front one makes sense and is perfectly fine. It's just a you little too to far forward. Grip, yeah. yeah, it's a little too far forward. The one on the rear just get completely unnecessary. Also was, have to break your grip. Right. So you've designed two safeties, neither of which is particularly fast to use. No. I will argue that the hammer block safety yeah. does kind of make sense to me in the sense that if you were going for it in your holster and you just thumbed the safety oh, off in yeah. the holster. That would be incredibly quick if you think about it. Unfortunately, most accidents happen on the draw. So not the best time to flick off your safety. But mm -hmm. I've noticed a handful of these guns seem like they were really designed to have the safety flipped in the holster. Well, that might be where the accidents happen. <laughs> yeah. But as a result of that. Stick it right through the femoral. Yeah. And then heel release, never been a fan of those. They just always tend to be a bit difficult for yeah. mag out, mag in. And as they start to wear down and they over travel like the rubies can, yep. the latch can get really stiff to insert a new magazine. And so it gets, you have to kind of get past the latch to get the magazine in there if it's not tuned in the way it's supposed to be. Yep. All right. Um, well, I guess we're back to our top five now. Oh God! We, and we, this is also the reason why we started at eleven, because the next pistol on your list is one that technically isn't a Great War pistol, because it turns out your top ten really was mostly pistols that served in the Great War. Right. Uh, this one is one that was adopted by the Chilean Navy. It was mm -hmm. almost adopted by Norway. It is a martially designed pistol that one underwent trials in many countries. Yep. However, it's mostly a commercial pistol. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is the Colt 1902. Yes. Right off the bat, I, I love the look on this guy. It's just so sleek. It's so slim. It, it, it just was one of those pistols that I still remember the foot shooting day actually so vividly because I had such a great time actually handling it. What is the number one most beautiful and coolest looking pistol of this era? Of this era? Yeah. Most beautiful and coolest looking? Yeah. It's the Colt 1902. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought he was actually personally asking me, and I'm like, my brain went into overdrive with that, thinking there's so many cool, weird things, not the actual cool, sleek things that we're, I think about. We're borrowing this from our buddy Sven. I wish I owned one of these things, because they're yep. so cool. They really are. Uh, Slide-operated, single-stack magazine. Yep, Unfortun 38. Yeah. Unfortunately, heel release. Yep. However... Uh, Eight rounds. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, nice straight grip. We'll talk about that in a second. Mm -hmm. Lock open on empty, which is yep. a early feature, like an early gun to use this feature, mm -hmm. but absolutely lovely. Fantastic. These were trialed in the Philippines. Like I said, they were used uh, by the Chilean Navy. Mm -hmm. What in the world mm -hmm. made you choose this, though, other than just being beautiful and having a couple cool things going on? Look, it's an incredibly... Incredibly sleek and slim feeling in my hands. The the actual grip itself feels fantastic, and that really length, that long length to it, just feels so comfortable. And anyone can practically handle this. You actually are able to yeah, handle I, this. Yeah, I, I deeply love this handgun. Very I, well. I believe it's a very natural pointer. Mm -hmm. The long slide, it, it seems a little awkward, but mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. I just point and go. Yeah, and, it really and is a good point shooter. There's something about that long slide that helps me orient the pistol so much faster because I can just watch it drop in. And then it's almost, it's sin that 38 is coming out of that thing because it feels like practically nothing. It, it handles the recoil in the 38 well. Yes, it is a locked breech. Yes. Uh, it's 38, oh boy, it's 38 ACP, not 380 ACP. Mm -hmm. So fairly comparable to 9mm Parabellum, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... Realistically, where where are our problems? Well, uh, also uh, the only on the positive oh, thing being it it locks open on empty. Yeah, awesome. like I said, a second. Ago. great, yeah. fantastic. So where where's the bad? Well, the bad comes. I mean, obviously heel release. Um, never a fan of those. And we it's not a terribly bad heel release. No, it's actually go. pretty positive. This one actually is uh, pretty decent because you just can do a gentle press and it kind of just wants to come out with gravity, no problem, right. which is great. It's not the worst heel release, definitely not by far. Um, and then. The, the cartridge is kind of 
could be staying to be stronger. Yeah. So what May's alluding to is 38 Super, which yes. came out after the war. It was very popular in 1911. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, I still think compared to a lot of these here, that is throwing more than enough metal. That's fair. Um, and then there's... No safety? Yeah, no safety. Yeah, it's, it's a bit weird without a safety. So you either have to carry chamber empty mm-hmm. or... L- like half cock? Yeah, or half cock is the yeah. safety. So th- it does have a safety in the sense that there's a half cock position. Right. But that means you have to thumb the hammer... Which I actually have started to come around to the idea of, by the way. Yeah. If you assume that this is a either holster active, like a, a safety that you activate when you reach for it in the holster, or if you think of it as equivalent to sort of the awkwardness of a C96 safety or some of these, like the even the Beretta we just had in our hands, mm-hmm. these awkward grip breaking safeties. Right. Cocking the hammer from half cock to full cock isn't really any worse than these weird safeties that are in bad positions. Fair. But that means at best we have a weirdly poor position safety. How well, are you, the it, only off uh, difference is that at least with those safeties that are awkward and weird, you know, you, you're not having to worry about accidentally slipping on the gun, potentially, you know, dropping the hammer all the well, way. Well, it shouldn't do that. It should only fall to that safety notch anyway. It should. <laughs> The harder part is setting the seat, setting it down. Right. Because that's when you're, if you've got it full cock, you have to ride it back, hold the trigger, ease it down. Mm-hmm. That's the nerve wracking bit, especially right, that's because. That's what I said. That's the easing the hammer forward. Like, yeah. it's the difficult it, especially part. Especially because your thumb is right there, too, mm-hmm. with the slide to come back. I, uh, right. You know, setting it up. Mm. That's the nerve wracking mm. part. Um, other than that, limited magazine capacity may be the other problem, but. I mean, it, well, it's got eight. Yeah, in this era, that's not bad. No, it's it, not for the era. It's not itself. the C96. It's not the 10, most amazing. Yeah, a few things are. Right. Okay, well, um, so that was number five. Unless yes. you're only counting things that went into the Great War, and then that doesn't count at all, and everything gets shifted down one, which is why we started with 11. Okay, Fair. now we're back on track because the rest of these are true to form. True. Uh, number four, you have listed the Steyr Hahn. Which is, oh god, yeah, technically more of a nickname. I don't think they called it Han, it's just the hammered Steyr. I get the feeling people are going to be upset because this is a stripper clip loaded. Yeah, how did that happen? We've got some magazine pistols that are behind a stripper clip loader. Yep, uh, we certainly do. Um, ergonomically, this one just had a lot of pros to it. It kind of, I still remember the first time shooting this because I had previously handled a, a 1911, it was yours actually, and then I had you handed me this and I went. It's very 1911-esque in terms of the feel. The rake's not quite the same, mm-hmm. but it's still very comfortable. The The trigger itself is pretty clean pull-through. Sights are, you know, they're actually decent read, you know, deep yeah, B-notch tall. Yeah, no, definitely can't. The safety is kind of in a similar S position. Like, I don't really have to break my grip that much to grab it, even though it's that far back. But it, the swoop on it is just so comfortable for, right. for manipulating. And then if you think about it, if I'm just thinking of just having to draw something and fire, well, this one's already going to be loaded. I don't really have to worry about the mag getting damaged at any point, and it's all set there and loaded. Right. So this thing uses its own proprietary 9mm tire cartridge, mm-hmm. slide-operated. Uh, it is a locked breech using a rotating barrel. Uh, it only feeds from a stripper clip, though. It, despite how it looks, no detachable box magazine. Right. That is probably going to be the Achilles heel, right? Yeah, that is always going to be the Achilles heel. I mean, if I'm thinking about it, if I don't have to worry about reloads, it's I, pretty I have, okay. I have a strange question for you. Hmm. If that had a detachable box magazine, mm-hmm. what would you complain about? Probably the proprietary cartridge. Yeah, but that's... the It wouldn't I mean, have been... If it had caught a, on. I mean, if it technically, had on. technically 9mm Parabellum was... Pride. There were more guns chambered for 9mm Largo than there were for 9mm Parabellum at this yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So there's no reason Steyr couldn't have become the standard cartridge if things had gone just the right way. Lock open on empty, I can't recall. It will, yes. Okay. You'd almost have nothing to complain about. And then it, it also has the mag, it also has a mag dump. <laughs> yeah, to release option. everything. Yeah, yeah to empty yeah, the magazine. Yeah. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, you're going to, you just said that so you could play the footage. I know uh, what you did. Probably. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't the know Shire what Han, complain about. If, it, if the Shire Hun had a detachable box magazine with the magazine release in a good position like the Luger, yeah. I think it might have made it to the very top of this list. I think it might have. The only thing is that the grip could stand to be a little bit more raked. I could, I could stand to have a little more rake with it, I think. Yeah, but, you know, one of the things you get 
I, I get that. I get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. One of the things you do get back on this pistol compared to all the others. Yeah. The easiest to work slide out of any of them. Oh, fantastic. The, the, easy. the clip guide and then this massive rear sight box that has these big notches on it so that you and can. And then huge serrations on the side. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You're out. grabbing these serrations. That's fine. But who the heck's using them? Because you can grab the box. Like right. you grab the ears and you just yank. Oh, yeah. And that is the easiest to use slide. Oh, yeah. Out of any of these guns. Hands it's, down. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then, again, you can cock and lock like a normal person. Yeah. And then just drop and go, and you barely break yeah, the thumb, Yeah, the thumb that you end up just dropping down with that safety, so easy to use. I, I could actually see, man, detachable box magazine might be the number one pistol to look great for it. They very well could but be. But they didn't do that. No. And I get why. It, 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 didn't these have stock options? Yes, they did. Um, not necessarily from military issue, but mm -hmm. as a private purchase, yes, there was an option. Uh, there's also some private. very bizarre adaptations of this gun. There's at least one where they bolted two of them together and gave it a shoulder stock. So it was like a doppel pistol. Oh, cool. Which makes me think of the stereophonic gun from Get Smart, which was... I a, don't even know what that is. It was just two revolvers welded together. It was the secret weapon of some agent of chaos. Okay. Um... <laughs> <laughs> sure. All right, so now we're getting to the big boys. Edging out the Steyr Han, mm -hmm. the Webley self-loader. Yes. In this case, this would be the Mark I naval is what we have access to. There was also, this kind of includes, sometimes we have to group them a little bit because mm -hmm. there's little differences. Um, this would include the Royal Horse Artillery version, which could yes. take a stock mm -hmm. and have an adjustable rear sight, but we have not fired that gun. Mm -hmm. We have fired this, though. Yep. So what's going well with the Webley? Um, well, we do have a slide operated and it's locked breech. Um, there's like a sort of tipping barrel in yeah, there, like but it's parallel dropping. Yeah. Actually, interestingly, that barrel, the way that barrel drops is like... more like the Colt 1902 than the Colt 1911. Yeah. Because the whole thing camps Just down. Just kind of one. Yeah, and there's little lugs. Yeah, it's very strange. Um, and then it's got a, uh, actual safety, uh, a grip safety. Mm -hmm. So that's always going to be a plus. No manual. Nope. No manual. The sight huge. Do they're, they're, they're the beautiful flower sights. This might be the most legible sights out of anything on this table. It's, it's pretty quick to pull up. I don't know. Sometimes I get the 1911 a little bit. Never mind. We'll get into that in a second. Okay. Um, and then just overall handling of it, it's it's pretty solid. I mean, I from what I recall, realistically, some of the biggest downside is just this heel release right here. Right. And then, in general, the grip is just not as comfy as it could be, but it is full fingered. There's Way extra room for the largest of man hands to go on this guy. So the grip could be better. Yep. Heel release push button. Yep. There's also the thing that bothered us, which is that it has sort of a training mode. Yeah, that little notch that you can get hung up on if you're not so if you fast insert, enough. So if you insert the magazine just, like if you just sort of let the magazine Even right there, in, it catches right there in the notch. Right. Now can you push it up? Yeah, you got to mean it. Right. You, you got to get it all the way into position. There is technically a position in which it acts as a single loader. So mm -hmm. it will lock open after every round and you throw one in and then you right. go to the next. Mm -hmm. It's a very unusual gun too in that if there's no magazine in the firearm and you withdraw the slide, it locks open. Mm -hmm. uh, because of that single shot feature, that's why it does that. So right. a lot of people know with lock open firearms that it's the follower pressing on uh, a tab or something that locks the gun open. Mm -hmm. Not, Not this. this one, no. It'll lock open with no magazine in the gun. It's, yeah. it's absolutely interesting. Not that it really affects any sort of combat efficiency, but it's no. just such a weird feature. And it's different from everything else, which kind of makes it a little more awkward for the average soldier who may have handled something else. Mm. Now, the 455 automatic cartridge that this gun spits is... Strong. Not 45 ACP, but fairly close. Yeah. Uh, it's more like a semi-automatic version of 455 Webley, but still a little more. Yep. And then the high bore axis on this, unfortunately, the two combined, it kind of, it flips a fair bit. Okay. Just not quite as uh, easy recoiling. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that I think that clears it out. We got through that one pretty quick. Pretty much. I mean, there there's some improvements that definitely needed with this guy. Um, just little, little changes here and there, but unfortunately... It's just not the, it's not the top, top boy. I still recommend watching our episode on this. Uh, it made it into our top three. It also has a very unique slide spring set inside one of the grip panels almost. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had animations for all that. It's a super fascinating pistol. It just has a very odd manual of arms. Yeah. To be honest with you. Even the takedown is kind of weird. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, number two is actually a smattering of handguns. 
Yeah, that one's, uh, well, it's mostly just because we didn't really have a way to reasonably break them up without just taking over the top Half five. Those, yes. Yeah. So what you're holding now is the Luger uh, model of 1900 as used by Switzerland. Mm -hmm. We grabbed it to be representative, although it's not the best of the Lugers. No, but it is the prettiest. Yes. <laughs> Uh, there would be also the German Navy P04. Yep. Uh, and then the German Army P08. Mm -hmm. Now, the P08 would be sort of all the improvements made to this gun in the same form factor. Mm -hmm. Later ones would turn up with the ability to take a shoulder stock already on the frame. However, they did not come with shoulder stocks. That was a vestigial uh, thing where they wanted to share production with the LP08 mm -hmm. for the frames. Uh, so a regular PO8 shouldn't have a shoulder stock, at least not one that was issued militarily. Right. Uh, so in that form factor, mm -hmm. you kind of have this, which is flat springs, early features, the sort of anti-rebound latch. Yep. And then later you have the improved coil springs, differences in the way the safety operates, you get the idea. Mm -hmm. But generally, same-ish pistol. Sure. What is there to love about the Luger? So if you think about this for a second, this pistol is from 1900. Yeah, it's four years after that C96 right there. That's crazy to think about. This is essentially defining the modern handgun. I mean, it's got a grip safety. It's got a, a push button magazine release. It's got like, it's even, it's got this like a, this, this flip safety in the rear. The only thing that's kind of weird is that it's not slide operated. Right. So that's modern, modern handgun ergonomics, oh, almost everything to the Luger. Mm -hmm. uh, may I borrow that? Yeah. A lot of people, we did our 1911 episode recently, a lot of people were not happy about the fact that I had to point out that the 1911 is absolutely Colt taking their model 1900 pistol, which did not look like this. It worked like that. It didn't even work as well as the 1902 because it didn't have a slide lock open. Right. It had a rear sight thumb safety and other weird, weird yeah. Browning and Colt were way over here. They'd come up with a very efficient locking system almost, mm -hmm. but everything else was bizarre, yeah. right? Slide, good. Locking system, needs some work, but good. The rest of it, what the heck are you guys doing? The Luger set the pace. Yeah. Um, and the U.S. government realized it, which led to developments of the 1911. This gun has a beautiful raked grip that is very ergonomic. It that has, grip does feel, it almost, actually, it's it's very Nambu-like in terms of the grip. Well, the Nambu is very it. Yeah. This sets the That's standard. That's true. Um, so you've got the magazine in the grip. The grip is steeply raked. It's very beautiful and well balanced to the rear. It's almost neutrally balanced, so it's very quick to turn. Mm -hmm. You have a very low bore axis, which is great for recoil. Yep. You have a potent enough cartridge to be a military cartridge, and yet short enough in the case and the overall length to fit inside of the grip, mm -hmm. which is actually where we get 9mm parallel bellum. This Swiss one was chambered for a 7.65-ish uh, bullet, and then when the Germans adopted theirs in, uh, especially like the P08, which was being worked on before the Navy adopted, the, it's a whole thing. Right. Uh, they just went for like, well, what if we straight wall that, that bottleneck case mm -hmm. to get the maximum allowable, which is 9mm. And so 9mm Parabellum becomes this kludge cartridge that then becomes the standard world over because it turns out that's really all you needed. Right. So it all fits in the grip. Uh, like I said, beautifully raked. I know I said that three times now. The magazine release is right where your thumb can reach it. Oh, yeah. Fantastically without, easy to without reach. Without thinking or really changing up your grip too much. And also on top of that, it's in such a place that you don't accidentally bump it. Not right. only is it easy to reach, but you don't accidentally bump it. You can have your thumb right there on it and not even touch it. With a modicum of intent, it is there. And with no intent, it is not. Right. That is very high design. Excellent. The magazine falls free on its own. And if it doesn't, you have a way to grip it very easily and yeah, get those, it out of there. Those little nubs, or not even, I guess not even nubs. What would you even call them? Oh, I'm not sure. A little finger. Discs. Finger points. I don't know. Finger discs. Pinchy doos. <laughs> uh, and then... The manual safety is in a position where you can reach it, and in the case of the Luger, more so than slightly later pistols, you do have to somewhat break your grip to use it, but not by much. No. Nah. And so it's a very conveniently placed manual safety. Yep. The point of this gun is that you can do most of the operations with your dominant hand. Yes. Work the safety, work the automatic safety, work the magazine release. All of it happens here. The only thing you need your other hand for is changing magazines mm -hmm. and working the, well, in this case, not a slide, but the toggle lock. Right. That is the same for almost any standard modern automatic handgun. Right. Everything on the right hand, left hand does the mag. Well, I mean, obviously the with a Star Han, you might be able to just put that on your shoe and then rack it, you know. <laughs> that's true. The, you could belt rack a Star Han, but right. that's not where we're at here. Uh, let me give that back to you. So then 
essentially would describe most Lugers with just this description that we've given. Right. We probably should talk about where they stand in their rankings because we've got, like you said, the the PO8, we've got the 1900 here, and we've got the PO4. 1900 is probably on the low end. Uh, yes. More diminutive cartridge, early flat springs that are prone to breakage, they're not the strong. Springs, yeah. the, the, as a matter of fact, the early 19, the 1900 model, it didn't have enough spring tension on the toggle lock to keep it from bouncing. So right. there's actually a latch on this gun. You can't just pull up on the toggle like you can on the later models. You, you have, have to, to go back, back and then to up. clear the notch for the, the latch. Then you can pull. Yep. And so... And you notice that. If, if you've handled Lukers before, you can you can perceivably feel that. It's like a feeling out the Martini Henry triggers, you know, the Mark yeah, 1 yeah, versus yeah, the Mark when you 2. Can tell the like, difference. Ooh. Well, you won't be able to open it. I've seen a lot of guys, guys grab 1900s for the first time and they've handled other Lugers and they just start pulling and they're like, what's going on? Yeah. And the answer is you got to come back and just keep on coming back and let it pop you up. Yep. Um, this doesn't have a loaded chamber indicator like the later models would. Mm -hmm. Little features like that. Right. So... So then if I'm thinking correctly, I would probably put the PO8 essentially just above this guy. Oh, yeah, significantly, Because yes. improvements in the springs and everything else and the, mm -hmm. the actual caliber. Why do I feel like you're about to tell me the PO8 was not your favorite? Well, we've actually, we talked about this in the Luger episode. The PO4, I still think, is the king of the Lugers. Right. This would be the naval pattern with yes. a slightly longer barrel, but not as long yeah, as the like LPO8. Yeah, it's like a medium range, essentially. I like that. That mm -hmm. felt really good in terms of the sight radius, too. It has a two-position adjustable rear sight. I loved that. that we don't great. have that here, by the way. No. We borrowed that, and it's gone back home. Mm -hmm. But the rear sight is closer to the eye. Yep. I think it's a little easier to pick up, just like you do. Yep. So... Why did you select the PO4 as your favorite Luger exactly, though? I think it actually, it splits the difference really well between offensive and defensive. Like, it's actually good middle ground pistol that gives me great chances for both. Now, granted, because of that longer barrel, I don't think it's as efficient at short range as, say, the PO8 or the 1900 here. Where you However, can just get them out of the, the holster faster? Yeah, yeah, I just can't, I just can't clear it quite as quickly. So as a, a result, it's But you're not going yeah. all the way up here like the LPO. No, I'm at least not reaching up all the way up into my pit for that. Okay. However, I gain the access to the long range that these two, that the, the PO8 and this one do not grant me because I'm able to do the stock attachment. And right. I have that longer, slightly longer barrel and that improved sight. I right. think the combination of that and the fact that it gives me both options, it's the best of both worlds. It, well, it's, it's, it's a really good middle ground, essentially. Right. You, you wouldn't say that it's the best short range and the best long range. No, it's it's in between. But it's, it's a and good compromise. And it gains compromise. me access to both. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I'm actually inclined to agree, especially if I'm thinking World War One. If I'm... Am I thinking like in a modern context where I'm going to carry it as a police officer or as a, um, even just as a personal defense as an open carry or something like that? Mm -hmm. The stock is a very dubious use. Right. And nine, 99 out of 100 days, even in a battlefield, it's going to be of dubious use. Mm hmm. Boy, that one day when you get told, "Hey, man, when we blow the whistle, we're going over top." You're gonna want. It. You're gonna want it. I would take three points of contact rather than one. Yeah, same here. I, I just would. So I see what you're saying there. All right, number one. Are we gonna surprise anybody with our um, number one? I mean, yeah, absolutely. The Campo Giro clearly defeats everything. <laughs> Pop metal. That was a good joke. <laughs> it feels like a. Pass, pass me the 1911. Okay, here we go. 1911 pre A1. Yes. All right, this is a slide-operated locked breech pistol with a fairly low bore axis, yep. a steeply raked grip. Very steeply raked grip. Seven rounds of 45 ACP. Yep, man stopper cartridge. <laughs> what do you love about the 1911? Well, ergonomically, it's just superior in a lot of ways to a lot of things. We have a wonderful grip safety here. Like you said, it's got this excellent steep rake of this grip that it's just a very natural and comfortable feel when you put it in your hand. Like it's a very decent point shooter kind of pistol. Yeah, it's over a hundred years later and people are still cranking 1911s out just for that feel. Exactly. Um, we have a nice modern uh, mag release with this button right here and it's very Luger-esque for its location too. Mm -hmm. However, I, I will say it's more pronounced than the Luger because the Luger's, if you look at it, it kind of goes into the grip a little bit, whereas mm -hmm. this one kind of sticks out more. Right. Perfectly fine, but I don't feel like I'm going to accidentally bump it. The trigger feels fantastic on it. Um, and then we have uh, the safety in the rear, which is very easy to flick on and off, I felt. Almost almost no change of hand position. Pretty much. As minimal movement as possible, even better than the Luger by a good bit. Yep. And then slide operated pistol, very easy to use. Lock open on empty. Um, it's even got a half cock. Not that you'd use it, but... Nah, it, 
Uh, I don't know. Decent if you said, cartridge. Did you say automatic grip safety? I can't remember. I think I said automatic okay, grip. Maybe I didn't. Auto, also automatic, automatic grip, grip safety, safety, which is honestly just means I can leave it, you know, cocked essentially, and then I can just draw with the grip safety and fire from there. Just cocked to make my case off. from before, everything below here was stolen from the Luger. I, <laughs> I know everybody wants to give me heck for it, but the, the development of 1911 is basically... The Colt 1900 slowly getting Lugerified on the low end, mm -hmm. and then coming up with a locking system that was strong enough for 45 ACP and also simple enough to borrow features from actually the FN 1903 that Browning had already developed. Right. So the the FN 1903's slide system managed to mostly be fitted to this once they changed the locking system from the 1902, which was the double link system that would never have supported that slide yep. structure. Now we have that single link set up and. Right. Everything's so you get FN-1903 plus Luger equals this, sort of. Yes. Uh, with some original ideas mixed in. But I agree. The Ergos are improved over the Luger. Mm -hmm. Easy mag changes. Oh, my God. Completely modern Falls magazine like chases. Changes. Uh, lock open on empty. Easy safety. Uh, slide. Great sight. Yeah. Slide release right there. Again, operable from the right hand. Yep. And, uh, yeah, fantastic. What are the problems with the 1911? Even though it's at the king, even if it's at the top spot, what what do you think it could have been improved with? Realistically, this is being nitpicky. 45 is a little bunch. Um, they could have stuck with nine. That would have been fine. It took us a long while to realize that, though. Yeah. Uh, the 1911 had focused on knockdown power. Mm -hmm. and there's still people that really believe in that versus just grouping a couple of rounds where they belong. I come from the side of capacity is more important than individual cartridge performance. And then on capacity, double stack mag, that'd been great. Yes, but none of those are this. No. Except for, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say none. The Bergman is a double stack. Technically, <clears throat> yes, for the six rounds. Just to get you six rounds, the C96 is a double stack for the most part. And that got you 10 rounds. So yeah. I give it to the C96. They they actually delivered on that. I'll point out this. <clears throat> I think this might be almost. No, okay. Technically, the C96 is sticking out a little bit lower than the Bergman in terms of the mag. But that that's insane. Well, you're also adding a lot of material to make it a detachable magazine. Right. So, yeah, the only two guns that went the double stack in this whole pile for the Great War. Mm hmm. Are the ones that had the magazine in front, front. of the trigger. yeah trigger guard yeah putting the magazine in the grip everybody thought well we can't make it too wide that's going to be awkward mm -hmm. it would take a long time right yeah now we do know of a semi double stack thirty two which is the savage that we yeah mentioned. the nineteen oh seven but that was pretty good so we're kind of quit. we're kind of asking the nineteen eleven to do something that nobody was doing at the time right I mean not nobody but nobody was doing it this it, way it wasn't common mm -hmm. and but then. Still, any other problems? Anything else stand out? I mean, maybe the sights could be even taller. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's all nitpicky stuff. And that's the thing is, I really feel like I'm just I, I'm I'm I've got my salad in front of me and I'm picking out little bits of of carrot. Yeah, my big problem with the 1911 is the takedown is a little bit. It's a little. Yeah. People love it because they're so like. You had so many I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get so many people punching. You had on. people hating on you in the episode for it, yes, even though you literally showed it's a little complicated. You guys need to understand. I've handled a lot of semi-automatic handguns, and to be honest with you, the, Luger, fair, the people that are complaining about they haven't handled a lot of semi-automatic right. handguns. The Luger takedown is better. The Monlicker 1905 has one of the best takedowns there is. It's yeah. unbelievably cool, and simple. Simple's better. Fewer parts laying around. Mm -hmm. If you want to service a Monlicker 1905, the, the lock work is an exoskeleton on the outside of the gun. It, it's it's fantastically cool. Yeah. Um, I would argue even like the Steyr Han has a better takedown system than 1911 to a Fair. degree. Uh, and actually, you know what? Let's, let's talk on that. So the 1911 won. This is no surprise to anybody. Hooray. Hooray. What might surprise you, though, is which would you pick between the 1911 and the Steyr Han if the Steyr Han had a detachable magazine? Ooh, that's a good question. Probably the 1911 still. Really? Because it still has a bunch of modern features to it that make it in some ways still superior to the Star Han. We've got that grip safety, the mag release. You know, I mean, if we could promise the mag release was the same, then they could equal it out potentially. I will say racking the Star Han is superior to mm -hmm. the 1911 just because it is much easier to grasp those big bulky wings on that site. Uh -huh. Um... It's a little tricky, doesn't it? Yeah, it starts to get into picking little things out here and there. I still think technically the 1911 would be superior. I think the Steyr is the closest we get to a 
9 millimeter 1911. Yeah, I could see that. In that era. Mm -hmm. You could argue that the Colt 1902 is the closest to it, but that heel release really changes things up. Yes. And of course, the lack of a manual safety or any safety other than the half-cock. And half then smaller cartridge. No, I mean, 30, no, because 38 uh, ACP is probably going to be fairly close to 9mm Shire. Okay. I, I would consider 9mm Shire, 38 ACP, 9mm Parabellum. I would consider them all in the safe range of, okay. you know, military 9mm. Sure. Um, but yeah, that's, boy, that's a tricky comparison, mm -hmm. isn't it? Uh, mm, I definitely would probably rank the Shire Hunt above the Luger. If it was a detachable box magazine with, I a, can rele see that. with a release in a good spot. Mm -hmm. It's got that feel. Hmm. All right. Well, you've done it. You have well, finally have. assessed all of the handguns. Maybe Some people are going to be fuming. I'm sure they will be. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's not. I don't think it's a bad representation. I yeah. do. I will say they we're probably a little unfair to the Glacenti, but I can't uh, get past it. That, me and that gun, man. We've handled others too. They've all been kind of. You're also. May and I sat down and discussed this. Both of us immediately put the Glacenti down. Yeah. It wasn't one of us following the other's lead. No, it was like, immediately well. it just went down to both of our lists. Because we did a comparison to kind of see where we all were with each other. We are pretty spot on with some stuff. Oh, by the way, we have not done an episode with the Brixia, the simplified Glacenti. Because we can't get it running. I have put two original springs in that gun. Main springs. Yep. I've done everything I can to it, and it just won't cycle reliably. Does anyone have a running Brixia that actually runs? Yeah, does it with not Colorado's. not? Don't put nine millimeter Parabellum in there. Put no. nine millimeter Glacenti load in there, and tell me it runs. Right. Mine kind of wants to run on nine millimeter Parabellum, which scares me. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's it. That's you have now seen have succeeded. all of the cool automatic handguns. Yep. I'll have to do some. Over one. Over one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I believe we shot enough 32 ACPs to cover those eventually. Yes. Look and then, forward to that. I don't know if we've done all the revolvers that we would need to do for the war. Probably not, unfortunately. I think we might have. It's possible. We've done a lot of revolvers that were not in the war. It's true. So don't get confused. We're not going to be talking about the 1870s revolvers. Or the Colt Patterson. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's got us covered. Yep. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about any of these guns, these have all been covered in the show. They all have their own episodes. Long documentary episodes. They're like an hour each. you got to yes. watch them for context. They will prove to you that we understand what we're talking about when we look at these. Yes. But otherwise, thank you for joining us. Have a good one. Night, everybody. Okay, so for those of you who are confused, uh, my buddy Sven from Manticore Arms is with me. Uh, what is about to follow is, I've actually recorded this after the episode now because I just realized what we've done to ourselves, is three hours of uh, boring crap. <laughs> but Wandering should, conversation. Yes, you should stay tuned if you would like to know what it's like to have your life uprooted by uh, legal action mm -hmm. and have to move halfway across the country and reestablish your business inside of three weeks <laughs> like six six, six. Like six. Yeah. um so uh stay tuned if you want to know the pains of a man on the march uh otherwise it's going to be regular unloading in the next one um i do recommend this though because sven has worked very hard on this but uh let's go ahead and play the intro